Heights and Southern Sun, Sustainable De-Risking uh, and a New North-South Partnership. Let me invite the panelists this morning, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Denmark, uh, the Permanent Secretary of State from Iceland, uh, Borge Brende, President of the World Economic Forum, uh, Professor Umu Salma Baba from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and they'll be moderated by Radhika Kapoor, uh, Professor at the uh, Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming them. Uh, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome uh, to this discussion on Northern Lights and Southern Sun, Sustainable De-Risking, and the new North-South Partnership. Uh, let me begin by first thanking the organizers for putting together this rather creatively titled session and, of course, bringing together the key actors in this conversation on this platform today. Now, as the parameters of Europe's economic relationship with China continue to be debated and tested, de-risking has emerged as a preferred approach to decoupling, which entails a complete disentanglement and threatens immense toil for the economies involved. De-risking assumes great urgency for the EU, as the EU is heavily reliant on China, particularly for rare earth elements that it requires so vitally for not just its green transition, but also for its digital transformation. 98% of EU's demand for rare earth elements is met by China. Now, in an attempt to reduce its reliance on China, especially for decarbonization, EU has adopted policies such as the Critical Raw Materials Act and the Net Zero Industrial Act. However, there are concerns about whether these policies alone will substantially reduce the many critical dependencies along the supply chain. What makes matters particularly tricky is that the US's response to its reliance on China has entailed industrial policies which involve huge subsidies that have led to the reshoring of production of renewables. In fact, it has also diverted some green tech resources from the EU. Now, the EU perhaps does not have the fiscal space to resubsidize its industrialization in the manner that the United States can. And so, therefore, as it continues its search for diversification of critical raw materials, it will not only need to undertake more concrete actions, but also look for many new partnerships. And that's the context of this discussion today. Uh, this panel will, of course, bring together perspectives from Europe, in particular the Nordic and Baltic countries, on what are the opportunities and challenges for such a partnership between the Northern Lights and the Southern Sun, which emerge as these countries craft their de-risking policy. Now, of course, before we start this conversation around the partnerships, I think it's important to understand a little bit about what de-risking entails. Because while we all might agree uh, on the need for de-risking, uh, th there is a whole spectrum of views in the EU around de-risking. What does it entail? What is the vision? What is the scope of de-risking? And for some countries, it's geopolitical factors that are driving de-risking, and for others, it's economic factors. So let me first start by bringing together, to start the conversation by understanding what de-risking entails. And so I request the panelists to briefly tell me what this entails for their country. And I want to start with Lithuania. Uh, Minister Landsbergis, uh, you know, you've been at the forefront of uh, this conversation on de-risking, if I may say that. You have uh, been borne the brunt of punitive trade measures from China. There were export restrictions in Lithuania. How do you envision de-risking uh, for your country and what does it really entail? Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here and kick off the panel. Um, I'd start not from uh, de-risking from China, but de-risking from another country, uh, or decoupling from another, another country, uh, which is even geographically closer to us, it's Russia. Um, Europe has sleepwalked into the dependency 
on Russian natural resources to such level that when the crisis started, we had to decouple basically in months, which enormous, with enormously high cost. Um, and I think that that gave a very belated, uh, but an alarm awakening bell, uh, that we cannot afford this sort of mistake for the second time. We cannot have a dependence like this on anything that we, we import. And Lithuania was, was in the forefront of uh, the first dependency as well, since in 2008, Lithuania has been paying the highest price in Europe for natural gas, because we had a sole supplier for it. We had a, one pipeline, one supplier, and the highest price. And since 2012, we decided, uh, actually a bit earlier, since 2010, and then in 12, we opened a, a first uh, LNG terminal in the region. That was the first step towards the de-risking from, from Russia. The same policy, the same idea we applied when it comes to China. We've seen the dependency on our imports growing, same way that it grows in, uh, in the whole continent of Europe. And we figured that, look, we cannot afford this. We have to de-risk. We, we have to find other, other partners when it comes to imports. We have to find other partners when it comes to investment into uh, especially vulnerable uh, areas in, in our country. And we have to find new trade partners and uh, quite a wider variety of partners when it comes to our exports. So that was the onset of how we set, set out to, uh, to our journey. And yes, uh, one example, uh, when, uh, when China applied a very, very strict um, uh, measures, or trade measures, or restrictions on Lithuanian trade when it, comes to, when it comes to China because they didn't like our foreign policy decisions, it showed why we were right in the first place. Why do you need uh, diversification? Why do you need the risking? Because a time might come when your dependency actually is turned or weaponized against you. And it's extremely harmful to any country. So we, we survived. We're fine. But we have a story to tell. And we hope that others, others might uh, take a lesson in it. Thank you. Uh, let me now turn to Denmark. Uh, Minister, what does de-risking entail for you? Uh, in October last year, the, the Prime Minister of Denmark went to Japan and she said, uh, you know, to the effect that uh, we have been too naive when it comes to being dependent and we need a de-risking strategy. What does that de-risking mean for Denmark? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel discussion. I'm, I'm very much in, in line with uh, Caprielos. Uh, our situation is slightly different even though we're a small country. I think we started de-risking without really knowing that we were de-risking uh, <laughs> back in the 70s because we were very, very hit by the oil crisis. We were too dependent on fossil fuels from the OPEC countries. And that started the Danish uh, wind adventure, which actually uh, brought us in a totally different situation than uh, Lithuania and uh, Europe uh, in, 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 in general. Um, I mean, basically, it's about not being too dependent on anyone. Uh, but I also want to warn all of us that we shouldn't be so afraid for things happening globally now that we bring ourselves in the opposite corner. I mean, the Danish history is a history about a small country we have gained all our prosperity from interaction with the rest of the world. And that goes way back to the, to the Vikings. Um, we have no natural resources, so we have gained all our prosperity from trading with the rest of the world. Among uh, them, China. We have a surplus in our trade relation with China, uh, rather different from many other European countries. So I think, uh, of course, we should de-risk, but we shouldn't decouple, and we should spend more time uh, generally at the global scene discussing what is the precondition for upholding uh, free, free trade, trade in, in the world. world. And, and that, that is, is a huge agenda, agenda about, about the international financial system, system about the WTO, uh, about Europe sticking together um, and holding together because we have had a tendency perhaps in the past to, uh, to, uh, to uh, act uh, as individual countries <coughs> instead of using uh, the force of, 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 of joining as an alliance. Uh, and I think uh, that should be my contribution to the start of this discussion. Thank you. Uh, let me now turn to Iceland. Um, Secretary Jolson, um, 
you know, what are the stakes for Iceland in this de-risking conversation? And when I ask you that question, one is also mindful of the fact that China actually has a huge interest in Iceland because of its know-how in geothermal energy and, in fact, is looking at, 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 at Iceland for enabling this geothermal transition to reduce some of its dependence on coal. Uh, how do you position Iceland in the de-risking conversation? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I can, uh, since Lars said he was from a small country, I can say I'm from an even smaller country. And uh, we have always been very aware of de-risking unknowingly or knowingly, as, as, as Lars put it. And we started also, since you mentioned the geothermal de-risking in the 70s, or we started earlier actually, but during the oil crisis, we, we, we started uh, utilizing geothermal uh, energy at a, at a greater scale than, than before. And we have been working with China uh, on geothermal uh, for uh, more than two decades. And uh, actually, the, the uh, carbon footprint uh, they now uh, are, are, are saving in, in China is more because of geothermal is more than Iceland's uh, coal uh, or carbon footprint. So, so and, and China is a part. We have a free trade agreement with China, one of few European countries as well. Um, so we, we uh, trade with them. We, we, they are not one of our biggest trading partners, but, but uh, an important one as well. Uh, but we also... Um, uh, thread this uh, path uh, carefully. Uh, we have not joined the Belt and Road Initiative like, uh, like some have, have done. We have also had uh, requests for investments. Uh, some uh, 12, 13 years ago, there was a request and an offer to buy 0.4% of the landmass of Iceland. 4,000 square kilometers out of 100,000 from China. Uh, we, that w was uh, rejected at that time. So, but it's not only de-risking, as, as, as last mentioned, it's de-risking generally. It's, it's just the principle not to have uh, all, all your eggs in the same baskets, and, and uh, uh, be it China or, or wh whomever, it's, it's just not wise. And uh, so just by diversifying our economy, having uh, FTAs with a, a, a lot of partners, we are part of EFTA, 80% uh, of our uh, free trade, uh, our trade is, uh, is covered by the free trade agreement. And I will come later back to our uh, FTA with India, but we concluded negotiations just days ago after 17 years and 20 plus rounds and uh, we hope uh, to be able to sign it in 10 days time here in, in, in Delhi. So I will be back. Thank you. Uh, let me turn now to you, Mr. Brende. We've heard these different perspectives on de-risking and of course, you know, across Europe, uh, if you bring in Western Europe, there's a different uh, understanding of what that de-risking entails and who's going to be taking the lead in that. But uh, apart from the capaciousness of the term de-risking itself, there is a bigger challenge of actually the uneven and difficult implementation of de-risking. Uh, because the fact is that we, re you know, China is a very large economy. It's developed a, its competitive advantage in strategic rare earth elements three decades ago, and it is not something which can be overcome in, in five to six years. Also, the Chinese state has given huge subsidies to the domestic industry, which has helped it to enhance its manufacturing capacity. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially in the context of clean tech industries, if Europe or the world in general were to also try to reduce its reliance on Chinese supplies, not only would that slow the green transition, but also potentially increase the costs of that transition as well. So there is the economic uh, cost to that de-risking as well. And one then fears that is it possible that a business first approach in a scenario like this uh, can actually ambush EU policymakers into the sort of um, energy dependence that we saw two years ago in the context of Russia? Thank you very much, and, and thank you for uh, that very precise uh, question. 
uh, we should not forget that there are risks with going too far when it comes to do risking too. So the growth this year is expected globally to be around 3%. The trend growth for the last two decades has been 3.8. So we're lagging behind. And um, the strategy that we have followed for decades to use the comparative advantages in the economies has led to a tripling of the global GDP since 1990. And the engine behind this growth has been trade. So when trade now is growing slower than the global growth, then uh, we are in a new situation. But when it comes to trade, one also has to use common sense. And um, for some years, maybe common sense wasn't that common, in the sense that, of course, as my Icelandic colleague uh, was saying, you should not put all your eggs in one basket. And this notion of, um, like, um, there is just in time, we saw during COVID is not sufficient as a strategy. Also, you have to have a strategy about just in case. But um, you have to balance this very, very carefully, as you're also alluding to uh, in your uh, question. A total disintegration of the global economy, of course, would come with a huge cost maybe 10% of the global GDP, that would be worse than um, a depression. But there will be adjustments. Of course, you don't want to have 90% of the semiconductors from one uh, factory or one country, all the antibiotics are from one place, uh, or uh, other products. Um, but um, I think we should continue on a path forward where we by input factors where it is uh, the cheapest, factoring in that you have to diversify. That will also mean that you're more competitive when you sell what you produce with those input factors. So I don't think we should lose the baby with the bathwater, but some small adjustments is needed. But we also need to have a trade recovery if we want a global economic recovery. There will be no global economic recovery without the trade and investment recovery. So here we have to follow a very uh, balanced uh, approach. But as also you mentioned, another additional factor here is the industry policy. So there is no a renaissance for what we then left decades ago is the industry policy. You tax people, take part of what you then bring in in taxes and use them on areas where you think there will be growth in the future. So hopefully those leaders that then do tax people and put it into areas that where they think there will be growth, they're right. That hasn't always been the case in the past. So the jury is out if these kind of industry policies really, really um, will work. You know, if you put five economists in the room, there's eight different opinions. Uh, but I think over time, there is partly consensus that you should look at the general conditions for industries, and then you leave it to the entrepreneurs and those do, that do know how to run businesses to run it and invest where they think the money over time will be giving the best return. Thank you, and, and thank you for that, that cautionary note on the fact that there is a risk of going too far uh, on de-risking. And of course, nevertheless, as you de-risk, you know, Professor Bava, what we've heard on this panel is that um, Europe has put all its eggs um, in the China basket when it comes to Asia, and there is a need to look for new allies. And India, of course, is, is a natural ally in that conversation. And in that context, there has been this, this discussion around the rediscovery of India, and we heard about it yesterday as well. Now, you have studied India-Europe relations in a changing world. How do you think the contours of that relationship have changed in the context of the green transition in Europe? And if I can add another mix 
uh, to that dynamic. The fact is that today India is a rising economic power which is far more globally assertive than it ever was. How does that also change the relationship between Europe and India? Thank you so much, Radhika, and good morning, everyone. Uh, let me uh, contextualize that question. Uh, I think we have to go back to a line, two beautiful words which encompass Indian philosophy and which will set the scene for a new partnership between India and Europe. And those two words are Vasudev Kutambakam. The world is one, one family. Vasudha is Sanskrit for the earth. There is only one earth, there is only one sky, and there is only one global population, even if it's a northern light and a southern sun. And I think we have to recognize that we are intertwined whether we like it or not. So to take your question on the issue of how has India-Europe changed with this green transition and de-risking, I think there's a political element to de-risking and then there is the economic reality of not being able to walk away. That means you can't decouple what post-90 has happened is that we have become far more interdependent and if you take a political decision as uh, crises will do and push and has happened in the case of Europe uh, to turn away from uh, you know, Russia in terms of energy supplies and then more so bring that same operating philosophy into the area of trade with China, uh, you, know, you have to go beyond what I would call as just framing it as a normative understanding. Uh, and if you look at India and Europe as natural partners and allies, India should be your first choice. I would not say the only choice. I would not be so greedy to say that. I think we, we have a little work to do on our end. But I think let's recognize that perhaps this cannot just be about political choices uh, for economic necessity. This has to be a human choice about developing different alternatives for tomorrow. We can't be short term for a few years and then live with consequences of political decisions which will produce effects which does not allow you to even de-risk and walk away. Uh, and business is invested in much longer cycles of 30 to 40 years as everybody knows about it. Political decisions are for the short term of till the next election cycle. And as we get into the, you know, the year of the, uh, of the mother of all elections, uh, that politics will guide a lot of decision. I think fundamentally three things are happening. First, uh, on the India-EU front, I would say that uh, there's a lot of positive sign on uh, you know, concluding the uh, free trade agreement and the investment with the FTA, it's going through and that's happening. Second, I think, I would, I would think that the collective wisdom at the high table uh, you know, is recognizing the need for a partnership uh, which puts the interest of the planet first and the interest of the state a, a little after that. Uh, there is only one ship on which we're all bound. If it goes down, we're all going down. I think that, that essence has to be transmitted and the green transition becomes extremely important in terms of the decision in Europe but also linking up to what, because half the planet's population is in this part of the world. Uh, you can't have a clear blue sky in the north if the south is not able to breathe easy. And I think that's extremely important to think how do we link up with technology, uh, sustainable financing, to make de-risking not real, uh, in a sense just another word which is the buzz of the season, but technically that which goes into moving words into action. Uh, and if you're able to reach you know, our SDG goals, I think we would have taken a step in the right direction. So I think that's extremely important in what is happening. Uh, and uh, in terms of the larger uh, political dimension, I think we're at a good point to see how, uh, you know, um, in terms of the development, there is a new recognition, I think, on both the European side and on the Indian side in making each other the partner of choice, uh, you know, in the current context. And in the way the current politics and the increasing uh, you know, new conflict and contestations have perhaps in that sense done a favor to both sides to revisit the way we reposition ourselves, not just as another strategic partner, I mean India has more than 30, but I think to make it the most strategic partner, uh, you know, and I think that is where we will have to do a little bit more work to take the conversation forward. 
Thank you. So, of course, there's a lot of interest in the partnership with India, but when we're talking about the Global South and de-risking, I think another important actor in this conversation is also Central Asia. Uh, Central Asia, with its supply of rare earth elements, um, can also potentially break uh, China's monopoly, and there's a scope for building a partnership there as well. So I'd, like, I'd now like to turn to understanding, especially the Nordic and Baltic perspective, on increasing engagement, not just with India, but also with Central Asia, to have greater collaboration, be it on rare earths or emerging technologies. And let me start with Denmark here, uh, because the Green Energy Strategic Partnership already provides a framework for that cooperation with India. But how do you see Denmark's engagement more broadly with the Global South? And perhaps if you could also say something in the context of the Nordic countries, what that partnership, the North, new North-South partnership entails for the Nordics. Uh, well, uh, sorry. First of all, I, I would like to say that I'm totally in line with the RIF uh, president when he said that there's also a risk if we de-risk too much. Uh, and there's also a risk if we generalize uh, too much and, and put, you know, different countries in the same basket. I hate that impression, the global south. What, what, what is the global south? Um, in, in Denmark right now, we started to discuss a comprehensive strategic plan towards Africa. Uh, and uh, It surprised me that, you know, many Danes, even in our industrial environment, look at Africa as Africa. I mean, uh, when the reality is that it's 54 different countries uh, with uh, totally different uh, circumstances linked to them in terms of uh, democracy, development, access to uh, uh, raw materials, etc. So I think the most important thing is to have a, if we want diver to diversify, we also have to have a nuanced look at the rest of the world. Um, that's, that's my perspective. Um, and talking about the Nordics, I mean, we have so many things in common. We are here as a joint delegation from the Nordic and Baltic countries. If we link our economies together, we would be a G10 uh, country, uh, and we could play a bigger role uh, if we uh, step up together. Uh, and, and, and that is at least the way I like to think uh, on, 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 on the challenges. And that's why we also have engaged with India uh, with this Green Strategic Partnership, because we like to think of ourselves as someone who have certain skills, and India has the scale. So that's a match made in heaven, so to speak. Uh, and I can see when I look at the figures that we make a difference in Denmark and India. Just one example, the company Danfoss has invested like 300 million uh, billion euro in, in India are going to triple that in, in, in the next decade. Um, so I think that's the way forward to engage with like-minded countries and to combine uh, competitive ad advantages and not being too dependent on a one-way trade relation. Um, we know for a fact that the global demand for lithium is expected to increase up to fivefold in 2030. And rare earth elements used in magnets for electric vehicles and wind turbines may increase by six to sevenfold by 2050. And, uh, and for that reason, we need to create alliances. And that's what we are working hard on in Europe. I mentioned that briefly in my first remarks, that perhaps there have been a tendency to uh, that, that the 27 European countries have acted alone, also towards uh, China. And if we join forces, I mean, and that's what we're working on uh, with these alliances, um, uh, we could make a huge difference. Thank you. Uh, Minister Landisberges, uh, the Baltics have emerged as an area of strategic interest for, for India. How do you see this uh, North-South partnership, and who would be the key actors for you in this partnership? One has, to, one has to say that 
there is a reason why you would see so many European delegations here in New Delhi today. Uh, apparently, it is, it is quite, uh, quite obvious uh, where do European countries see uh, strategic uh, direction, where to. Um, but, but definitely doesn't stop there. Uh, as my colleagues have mentioned, um, you know, ASEAN countries uh, have so much, uh, so much to offer. Uh, and, and the partnerships that we already had with countries uh, in, in investors such as Australia or Japan, uh, South Korea, which are being rekindled right now as well. So we're seeing a you know, much wider approach, a global approach from, from Europe uh, than, than ever before. But it also, you know, I would like to stress one, one additional thing, is that uh, you know, we're, we're talking about the approach from, from the governments, what uh, national governments or what the European Commission can do to encourage diversification, to uh, encourage this broader approach. But there's also an element where businesses do what businesses do. Uh, it's up to them to decide where do they want to invest, where they want to, you know, who do they want to have partnerships with. And it's mostly about the bottom line. It was always about, about the bottom line. Where, where it's cheapest, where it's you know, the most, most, most convenient, where it doesn't hurt, or it does help them the bottom line. But what we see now is that there are additional factors that do affect this bottom line. And they are more of a, I would call, metaphysical nature when we talk about values such as rule of law. If we want to invest, if a company wants to invest or have a long-term partnership, be it with, uh, with trade or imports or exports or investment, whatever, they need to know where does the country, where does the government stand? Because we've seen in the past where things do not go well because the governments do make political decisions when it comes to trade. They, uh, they limit the, the, the abilities of companies, they hurt the companies, and they hurt the bottom line. So it's also, you know, we, we have to take this, this into, um, uh, into consideration because we're seeing, you know, some of the countries have falling investment rates. Not because, the, you know, the government or, or, or Madame von der Leyen said, you know, that you, should, you shouldn't invest there, you know, because nobody would say this, but the companies are choosing because they don't believe that this, this country is headed, you know, in, in the best of directions for their bottom line. So I think that, you know, going back to your question, you know, Nordics and Baltics, we're quite pragmatic people in most, most of the cases. So I think that many companies are actually checking what is most, uh, most profitable for them. Right. Uh, so actually, you know, that, that's a very important point. If I can bring in uh, Mr. Brenda in, in on this. You know, when companies make these decisions to invest, it is driven by the bottom line. And of course, there are a whole host of structural factors which, which impact that bottom line in, in many countries in the global south. So what do you think it would really take to scale up investment in the global south? So I, uh, let's use India as an example. Uh, India is today uh, around three trillion US dollars economy. And um, I'm very uh, bullish on growth in India moving uh, forward. I think in a decade, a 10 trillion uh, US dollar uh, economy. And um, why is that? Uh, one of the reasons is that India is now well positioned where we see increasing growth when it comes to digital trade and services. So digital trade is today 15% of the global trade, but is growing double as fast as um, traditional goods. The same is for services. So with 1.4, also 1.4 billion people with a digital identity, it gives a good positioning in what we're now facing, um, new um, situation when it comes to uh, technology and opportunities. And I think this can also be a learning for other developing countries that you have to have the right skills. You also have to look at, of course, predictability, red tape, um, and making sure that it is attractive to invest also um, as a foreigner. So, of course, India is also, coming back to the, the main topic about de-risking, India has also been, um, is in a fortunate position that it's benefiting from this French shoring. So, 
Five years ago, none of these iPhones were produced in India. Today, 25% are in, produced in this country. So India is benefiting also from the de-risking, provided that the de-risking doesn't go so far that it has too much of a negative impact on the global growth, as I was mentioning. And um, the system that we had in the past with the comparative advantages. We should not underestimate it also in the north-south context because since 1990, two, we, we moved from 42% of the global population living in extreme poverty to 12% today. That's just incredible. And we added 2 billion people on top of it. So um, that success kind of scheme where trade was at the basis of it, we also have to continue on that path. But of course, we have to factor in some of the things that were mentioned with diversification and level playing field. And that was one of your first um, yeah. questions or premises. Of course, if you compete, you should compete um, on the same terms. And there you come into areas like state subsidies and also industrial policy. So, the anti-dumping measures, I think we have to be very conscious about uh, also moving forward. Right. Thank you. And I want to build on this trade question. And here I'd like to turn to Aysen. Secretary, uh, you mentioned that you know, India is now close to uh, closing the trade agreement with the EFTA. Uh, other than the trade aspect, what are the other dimensions in which you think Aysen can expand elements of cooperation with the Global South? Well. Yeah, cre creating a foreseeable uh, legal framework like free trade agreements is, uh, you know, paves the way for for investments and, and cooperation. Uh, and and uh, I, I mentioned the FTA with India. We also have uh, similar agreements with with a lot of countries in Africa as well, and uh, that helps uh, our our economic operators to to. Uh, share experiences in, in the field of geothermal, in the field of fisheries, where we, have, uh, we are now utilizing almost 100 percent of every cut we, we, we fish, where we used to throw away 50 percent, uh, only fill it, and, and then throw the rest away some, some uh, 25 years ago. So this is, we, are, we, are, we are sharing. We have 3 billion uh, people. Uh, having their source of nutrition from the oceans. So there is a, a, a lot of engagement there, uh, uh, both for Iceland as such and al also uh, with our, our Nordic uh, and Baltic uh, partners. Uh, and, and this is what we are doing through our, our development uh, cooperation, etc. So there is a lot of uh, uh, fields to be, de be covered and activity. Excellent. So before I open to the panel, uh, open the discussion to the floor, very briefly, Professor Bhava, uh, we've heard all of this from the European lens. Let's just flip the prism briefly and, and, and you know, hear something about who India sees as potential partners when it's trying to manage and balance its own uh, China strategy and what should we be doing to strengthen those strategic partnerships? So um, we have a range of strategic partnerships and uh, I think it's very clear that the European theater and the Indo-Pacific theater are interconnected. In fact, all theaters are interconnected. So there's, uh, you, while you manage the uh, economic dimension of your interdependence with China, I think it's also important that India is looking at strengthening the political aspects of its strategic partnerships with Europe. And we have a strong sets of bilaterals over there. Along with the India-EU strategic partnership, we've got strong bilaterals. We've just recently had uh, the Nordic Baltic uh, Business Council meeting as well with India. And of course, there's the other dimension of the Atlantic of uh, the relationship with the United States. So I think India is looking at, I would uh, you know, hesitate to use the word uh, multi-alignment, but India is very pragmatic at this point in time to see that uh, if you're looking at uh, diversifying supply chains, uh, preventing the risk and the impact what we have witnessed in the last uh, you know, decade, but more so in the last few years, I think that pragmatism is being met by very strong policy choices from New Delhi, which has definitely put Europe uh, central to its policy of expanding uh, and uh, you know, reducing 
Uh, and so it's a different kind of asset management of your basket of investment portfolio, I would say, in which while, uh, you know, as uh, Borg, you just mentioned, you can't go too fast too soon. You can, there's a fear of taking everything down. So I think while you politically manage some of that, you also enable conditions, and Europe is, I think, uh, the partner of choice for India and will remain. Right. Thank you so much. And we have very little time, but we do want to take some questions from the floor. Uh, so um, I'd you know, first like to take, if there are any Raisina young fellows who would like to pose questions, I'd urge you to come forth, please. I will take just three, maximum four questions and get back to the panel because we're short of time. Yes, please, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you so much. My name is Dr. Levan de Ganamors. Uh, I'm a researcher and lecturer about India and Indo-Pacific from Israel. And I would like to know, uh, I believe that India and Pacific region, and uh, especially India, has a crucial role in the world supply, uh, supply chain. But I would like to know, to hear your regional perspective on how you see your role in uh, the near, near future, and what is the regional vision for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I can take these two questions. The lady in blue. I'm Kanakwali Surya Narayanan. I'm an advocate and polar law scholar from University of Akureyri, Iceland. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Denmark and uh, uh, to the Secretary of Iceland. Uh, so the Arctic Council is on a pass, and China is more and more uh, coming into space as, and looking at the polar silk route. And uh, this, uh, the, 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 it's completely on a breakdown. The system is on a breakdown there. So how do you see that uh, Iceland and Denmark could continue to you know, uh, engage with the rest of the world? Because uh, especially with Greenland, you have more and more engagements, the diplomatic engagements with uh, China. And also China is looking at investments in minerals. And also in Iceland, Finnafort is, uh, you, you look at an Arctic hub in the future, and it perfectly aligns with the polar Silk Thank route you. of China. Thank you. So I would like to hear your very briefly, if you could just quickly summarize your question in one Hi, line. good morning. I'm Rahul Banerjee. Um, my, my question is to Minister Rasmussen from Denmark. Uh, Minister, Denmark and India remains one of the major partners when it comes to green energy transition. And Denmark remains India as one of the most trusted partners. How do you see this green strategic partnership shaping up in the coming uh, decade, maybe? Thank you. So I'm going to turn back to the panel. If you'd like to respond to the questions, start with you, Minister Landis Burgess, and we'll go down. Well, um, I wouldn't be able to respond to any specific question. I'm just saying that uh, the mood here in, in the panel is, is really uh, festive and from the questions as well. So I believe that we are on a very good track uh, for uh, increased partnership in, in the future. I'm really glad that this panel was about uh, Nordics and Baltics. Uh, mostly, so we we tend to feel the strategy or strategic approach here. So I'm hoping for the best for the future, and thank you for the, the question. Um, well, first of all, uh, the Arctic. Um, I mean, there's no secret that the cooperation uh, in the Arctic is challenged by Russia's unfair, full, illegal aggression uh, in. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, they have suspended the payment to the Arctic Council, which is led by Norway. We are going to take up the chairmanship uh, next year, and uh, and we are very careful how to conduct this because we want to keep the Arctic as a low tense uh, area. Um, but there's also a lot of possibilities, as uh, the second. Uh, uh, person ask about a uh, link to Greenland. Um, Greenland is a part of the Kingdom of Denmark together with Fair Island, um, and it's probably complicated to understand from an outsider's perspective, uh, but, but Denmark is a part of the European Union. Greenland is not a part of the European Union, but we are working hard, they're working hard to uh, have closer ties uh, the President of the Commission will uh, visit Greenland uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, the European Union are going to open a new representation, uh, a new facility in, in the capital of Greenland. And Greenland actually have access to many uh, of the uh, rare earth elements uh, we just talked about. Yeah. 
Uh, it is not easy because there's a lot of environmental questions linked to it as well. It's totally up to the Greenlandic authorities to decide uh, what to, to, to do. But what we are trying to do is to create this framework with a closer connection between the European Union and, uh, and Greenland. Uh, and there's a lot of potential linked to that. Uh, the final question was about uh, the potential in, in this green strategic partnership between Denmark and, and India. And I think it is huge. Uh, I had the honor yesterday to uh, attend signing of uh, four new agreements between Danish companies and, and, and Indian companies, and there's a huge, huge potential. Because, as I said earlier, uh, we like to think of ourselves as someone who has the skills, and India definitely has the scale. Uh, our problem <laughs> in the long run is that India definitely also has the skills, so we have to, we have to keep up. Uh, in order to, uh, to be uh, a, a, a preferred partner for, for India in the long run. But that's absolutely our ambition. Thank you. Yes, Would you like to take the question nice and second? Yeah, please. yeah, we, we got the question on the, on the Arctic, and, and uh, I, I concur with what Lars said on, on the Arctic Council. There are challenges. Uh, I wouldn't describe it as, as the question was that is, it is falling apart. That is uh, not the case. Uh, we have challenges there. Uh, on the engagement with others uh, in, in Iceland, I, I described it a little earlier. You know, we, we, of course, we are open for cooperation with others, but we also have to thread that path uh, carefully, especially with those with uh, big ambitions. So uh, I think we will we will uh, manage that uh, as 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 an as an Arctic state as well as a, 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 a normal trading partner. Uh, one one other question because you asked about the engagement with the global south and and uh, and that is what we do uh, everywhere. And I'm going to Abu Dhabi to the WTO meeting after after I've been in Delhi, and we are also always pro promoting. Uh, the gender, the gender issues and, and, and trade and gender, and we have to bring uh, girls and women on, on board uh, wherever and in whichever context. So thank you very much for, 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 the, uh, for, the, for letting me participate here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, the red screen in front of me is flashing and telling me the time's up. But this has been a truly fascinating discussion. And like Minister Landisberger said, I think the environment is very festive. And the conversations on this panel suggest that we are at perhaps uh, a unique inflection point of the relationship between India and, and Europe. And I hope that we see the strengthening of this strategic partnership uh, in, in the years to come. So thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you for your comments. Thank you.